Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Dante Fortson here with Unmasking the Gentiles, Part 3, The Curse of Japheth. So, some of the stuff I'm going to be talking about tonight, some of you have probably never heard. I can almost guarantee you have probably uh, never heard some of the stuff I'm going to say tonight. And I'm probably going to upset a few people, but that's okay. I always upset a few people. Um, and speaking of upsetting a few people, the Brotherly Love video. I uh, was getting a lot of hate from some of the camps. Uh, well, not camps in general, just some people who adhere to camp doctrine. And they're trying to find a way to weasel out of obeying those commandments to say, thou shalt not abhor an Edomite and thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. There's no way around it. They claim to keep the law. They have to keep those two laws as well. So before we kick off everything, I'm going to go ahead and read the prayer request. For those of you looking for prayer, you can go to bhitbforums.com and it'll take you right to the uh, forums. You can post your prayer request in there. You do have to register first. And there are people in the forums uh, praying for people. And I encourage those of you listening to pray as well. Uh, so the first one is for Ian, for his wife to come to the truth and for them to get on one accord. Uh, Yoruba for finances. Tanya gets real. Her family's health issues. Yashika Black, her husband's salvation and restored marriage. Delois or Delois, uh, um, you can contact me and let me know how to say that so I don't butcher your name every time. Uh, family feels like it's being torn apart. Uh, Nicole, her hang her anger problems. And Tracy wants a prayer for her children's salvation. Courtney, Braden, and Bryce. And again, shout out to Ruhama, who is still in the forums praying for people. Uh, so once again, if you need prayer, go to bhitbforums.com. And speaking of the forums, the contest is still going uh, for the mystery box at the end of the month. It's really still anybody's game. There's about a little over 300 registered users, but not a ton of activity on the forum, but it is active. And there is a good debate going right now. Is wisdom the Holy Spirit? It has turned into a debate like I thought it might. Uh, so I will be moving that over to the iron versus iron uh, forum. But for those of you who want to go in there and drop your opinion on um, the debate currently going, is wisdom uh, the Holy Spirit? You should go over there and check that out, bhitbforums.com. All right. For those of you who want to support, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash Dante Fortson. Uh, if you have cash app, you can support via cash tag bhitb. The PayPal link is in the description. And for those of you who catch the live premieres, you can always support via Super Chat by clicking the dollar sign. If you do not have it to support financially, a share and a prayer are always appreciated, especially shares on Reddit. All right, so today's study is going to be brought to you by Unmasking the Gentiles, the European plot to replace Israel. Uh, so those are the notes on a lot of the stuff I'm going to be covering throughout the series. So if you have not read that, um, it is definitely one you want to add to your um, bookshelf. And also undeniable full color evidence of black Israelites in the Bible. This is not doctrine. There's going to be no verse for verse debating in here. It's just full color evidence of um historically black people and that's what it is it's nothing to debate it kind of shuts down all of the um people who say it doesn't matter so it it matters because the truth matters so if you don't have undeniable grab that copy from amazon or barnes and noble all right go ahead and hit the thumbs up button for me and for those of you who are not subscribed yet, click the subscribe button. And for those who are already subscribed, make sure you click the notification bell and click all notifications. So YouTube actually just added a stat that lets us see how much of our notifications are going out. I know a lot of people were saying that YouTube is blocking notifications for certain channels, um, but they did just add a stat that lets you see how much of your or how much of your audience is notified and how many people actually click the notification to come through and see. Uh, so if you guys thumbs up, it'll make sure that more people see this and the more people that click it, the more people will come through and watch it, all that stuff. Um, so anyway, yeah, make sure you click the all notifications button so you can get all the notifications when the next part of this series comes out. All right. So we're going to start with a verse from Isaiah. Remember the former things of old for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Isaiah 46 verses nine through 10. This is going to be a very important verse throughout all of scripture, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet 
done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. That is God's blueprint, fingerprint, I guess I should say fingerprint, declaring the end from the beginning. And even with him declaring the end of the uh, from the beginning, no matter how much people try to change it, it's still going to come out exactly as he wants. I, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So let's get started. Um, now, the first part of this that I'm going to present you, this is not my original research. I actually learned this in the 90s when I was still in high school, late 90s uh, through Chuck Missler. And I'm not sure if he learned it from anybody or if he dug it up himself, but I'm going to go ahead and give Chuck Missler the credit for this um, for this part of the study. And the what you're seeing right now are the Hebrew letters Aleph and Tau. Aleph um, here, Tau here, the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And these are going to be two very important letters in the Bible, but they are often not translated. And because they are not, well, actually, they're never translated. And because they're not translated, we lose a lot of context sometimes. So we're going to read here. Uh, most of actually yeah, most of the lesson tonight is going to come from Genesis chapter nine, verses um, 20 through 28. So right here we have I'm going to start reading verse 20. And Noah began to be a husbandman and he planted a vineyard and he drank of the wine and was drunken and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father and their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, blessed be the Lord God of Shem and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. All right, so let's get into this. So Noah was drunk. We're we're gonna um talk about Aleph and the Tau, but uh, we're gonna make a couple of pit stops in between there. So Noah became a husbandman, and he grew these wine, grew the grapes, he made wine, and he got drunk. And we're gonna see here um, the word used for uncovered. So when he was drunk, he was uncovered. It some of the translations, I believe the NAS. Um, translates it as he uncovered himself and other translations imply Noah was uncovered by somebody else. Uh, but the word right here is going to be 1540. Um, way at gal. I think that's how you pronounce it, but we'll come back to that in a second. Now, when we get to ham, people, people, some people say, well, ham uncovered Noah's nakedness and it's hard to say that that's a false teaching outright. I think it's just because the way the text is written, it's misunderstood. Um, but the curse on Ham is definitely a false teaching. We'll talk about that in a second. But to say Ham uncovered the nakedness, I think it's just because of the way uh, the verses, um, the yeah, the, ver the verses interpreted or translated. So right here, you see 1540. He was uncovered. Now it says Ham saw. This is 7200 way are it's a different word. It, it says Ham saw the nakedness of his father and then he went out and told his brothers. He went outside and told his brothers. So. There's two different words used there. It doesn't say Ham uncovered Noah. It says Noah was uncovered and then it says Ham saw it and then he went outside and told his brothers. Now, you would think that if Ham was the one that uncovered his father, that he wouldn't run right out and tell his brothers. But we're going to come back to that. Well, we're, we're going to put it's a lot of stuff that happens in these two verses. So back to the Aleph and the Tau, the Aleph and the Tau makes the word et right here. 853 et. You see the Aleph, you see the Tau. And I'll go back one more time so you can see it big. Aleph, Tau. And you see Aleph, Tau. Now, together, this is an untranslated word. They never translate it in scripture. And I'll show you that um, as I show you some more scriptures that that have this word right here. So. What this means is from beginning to end or first to last. So you have Aleph, the first letter, Tau being the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So 
Ham, in the context of this, let me not miss that part. Ham, in the context of this, Ham saw his father naked and then he went outside and told his brothers from beginning to end what happened. Now, this is important. He told them from beginning to end what happened. So Japheth and Shem get the full story. We don't get the full story. Japheth and Shem get the full story. So now we get down to verse 24. Uh, and Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. Now, we're going to talk about the younger son too. Again, a lot to unpack. But again, we see this word et right here, 853, the Aleph and the Tau. So in context, Noah woke up from his wine. This is after Japheth and Shem cover him up. He wakes up from his wine and he knew from beginning to end what his younger son had done unto him. And again, people assume this was Ham. And again, it's all in the interpretation. So I wouldn't exactly call it a false teaching. I would call it a, a misunderstood translation or a, a misunderstood reading of translation. Now, you have to understand that in Hebrew, and you can verify this yourself by reading through the Bible, you will never find the word grandson or granddaughter. You will never find the word grandmother or grandfather. They always use the word father to refer to all ancestors of male lineage that came before them and mother to refer to all female ancestors. And so the older ones were referred to everyone below them as sons and daughters. There were no granddaughter, grandfather, grandmother, grand um, daughter, grandson, you, you know, all of that. None of that. None of the grand stuff that we have now. And this is important because the grandson, even the youngest grandson could be referred to as the younger son. So it doesn't necessarily mean that Noah was referring to Ham. And I'm going to show you a few things why I don't necessarily think that Noah was referring to Ham at all. So, again, we have this right here, the, the et. Um, Noah knew from beginning to end what his younger son had done to him. So it's consistent. We see it's untranslated and in context, it makes sense. Now, this word et also appears in the Genesis chapter one. And again, this is not my personal research. This is still um, Chuck Missler right here. Um, the Noah part was actually my research. The, the et, the beginning to end with Ham and Noah. That's me. But this is Missler again. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So we find this word et. So in the beginning, God, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, created the heavens and the earth. Remember, I started from Isaiah, I alone, declaring the beginning from the end, all of that. We'll come back to that. In Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, we see it again. Now, Zechariah chapter 12, uh, 12, verse 10 is interesting because of the way it reads and what it's about. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And here we see again the word et. they shall look upon me, the first and the last, the beginning and the end whom they have pierced. 853 et, the Aleph and the Tau. So we see that it's consistent. First and last in context, it's the equivalent to the Greek alpha and omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So when you get to Revelation and you see Revelation chapter one and Christ comes in, and he introduces himself. I am the alpha or I am alpha and omega, the beginning and the ending, the Aleph and the Tau, saith the Lord, which is, which was and which is to come, the almighty. Now, another way of saying which is, which was, which is to come is I am. I am the same one that revealed himself to Moses. He just dropped all of his titles right here. The Alpha and the Omega. The Aleph and the Tau, the beginning and the end. I am. He was. He is. He always will be. The Almighty. How he introduced himself to Abraham. So understand that all of this stuff is connected so let's let's get back to Noah's nakedness being uncovered. We're going to break this down a little bit more. So 
there are a lot of theories on what happened to Noah. And we're going to talk about a couple of them. So it says, and Noah awoke from his wine. This is uh, chapter nine, verse 24. And Noah awoke from his wine and he knew what his younger son had done unto him. So those that um, some people will point out that the book of Leviticus says you shouldn't uncover the nakedness of your father because it's the, or the nakedness of your mother because it's the nakedness of your father. Um, but I think that's a little off because they'll try to apply it and say, well, Noah's nakedness was really ham uncovering his mother. But the Bible refers to the nakedness of the mother as the nakedness of the mother. Um, it refers to the nakedness of the father as the nakedness of the father. It doesn't necessarily have to mean something else just because it says it outright. I believe that Noah's nakedness was uncovered. Let me say that. I just don't believe it was Ham that did it. And so the word right here is Gala 1540. Gala, it means to uncover or remove. And this is what I was saying about the NAS. The NAS translated as Noah became drunk and uncovered himself. And then the KJV translated as he was uncovered two vastly different interpretations both of those can't possibly be right either somebody uncovered noah or he uncovered himself so let's look at it did ham do it and i mentioned before ham it says ham saw it uses a different word than uncovered so some people say that Ham uncovered his mother and they had sex and then she conceived Canaan and Noah woke up and knew what happened and named Canaan in his curse. A strange theory. But then you have to explain why Noah or why Ham would run outside and immediately tell his brothers the story from beginning to end. Like, hey, guess what me and mom just did. And then equally as strange is the notion that Ham did something to Noah and then ran outside and told his brothers, hey, guess what me and dad just did? And then his brothers went in and covered their father up. I don't know if that to the people that believe it, I don't know if that ever seems strange to you that Ham would immediately go out, outside and tell his brothers and then they would go in and cover it up. And so I started to notice interesting things throughout the text. And so I prayed on it and I thought about it. And I'm not going to say God gave me any kind of revelation because I'm always trying to be careful about that. Because um, I feel like that shuts down the conversation. Once you once people start saying God told me or God showed me this, it, the conversation shut down. Because, I mean, what do you say? What do you say to that? No, God is lying or that's not God, because then that turns into a whole other conversation. So I'm not saying God told me this or anything like that. So one thing I noticed is in the curse. Now I talked about how younger son could refer to the grandson. Canaan. Canaan is the only grandson called by name throughout the whole chapter. And in fact, Canaan is named five times. And I thought that was significant because Canaan has brothers. Japheth and um, Ham have already started having kids by now. And I'm going to tell you why, because Noah began to be a husbandman. So I looked it up. It takes at least three years from the planting of the grape seed to a viable grape that you can make wine with. It takes three years and then another six weeks process to make fermented wine. And then the longer you let it age, the better it is. So it's at least three years and six weeks out. If Noah planted the um, seed the day he got off the ark, which he probably didn't. So we don't know how long it was before Noah became a husbandman. It says Noah began to be a husbandman. So it was probably some time. I'm not going to say as a year, two years, three years. I don't know. But the chances are that there were a lot of kids running around there. And chances are kids doing what kids do. Hey, it'd be funny to strip our grandfather's clothes off while he's drunk and he'll wake up naked and ha 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 to be funny. Possibly. And again, this right here is a possibly I'm not saying this is what happened right so then Ham goes in sees his father naked and he comes out and tells his brothers what happened and they say you know what let's just cover it up and dad will never know what happened and then everything will be all good and again possibly you might think I'm reaching but I'm going to show you why I, I think this may be the case what Japheth and Shem did would be deception when they went in there and they covered Noah up. Now, we always get sidetracked by the fact that they turned their faces away and did not see Noah naked. 
because they weren't up to anything suspicious. Ham walked in and came out immediately. When you go do something wrong, like mess around with your mother or father, you don't immediately go outside and tell your siblings, hey, guess what? And your siblings don't immediately go in and cover up your crime for you. Like that, that's a whole weird family dynamic if that's what's happening, which I don't believe. So Japheth and Shem were in an attempt to deceive Noah into thinking everything was cool, nothing happened, you just passed out drunk, drunk and you woke up covered up. So let's compare again, Leviticus um, 18.7 to Genesis 9. So Ham saw, 72, Ham saw, and then right here the word is uncover, 1540. Two different words, Ham did not uncover Noah. Ham saw that Noah was naked and he went outside and told his brothers. So then Noah wakes up and he remembers from beginning to end, Aleph to Tau, Alpha to Omega, what happened to him. So there's a curse that happens. And this curse is the source of false doctrine. People refer to it as the curse on Ham. And we see that Ham, Ham, Ham was not cursed. We're going to, I don't want to get ahead of myself. But it appears after a lot of prayer and, and reading and really digging into this text, it appears after rereading it, that what actually happened was Noah cursed everyone except for Ham. And so this whole time we've been told that Ham was cursed, Ham was cursed, Ham was cursed. And Ham himself may not have been cursed. He may have been the only one that did not get cursed. And I'm going to show you why. So right here, uh, starting at verse 24, Genesis chapter 9, verse 24. And Noah awoke from his wine, and he knew from beginning to end, I'm adding that part in, what his younger son had done unto him, or possibly grandson. And he said, cursed be Canaan. So now he names his grandson by name. Now, Canaan, if born after the flood, was at least three years old, possibly older. Now, if this was a prank, I'm going to tell you why I think it may have been a prank that involved the other brothers. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Why? Because the older brothers probably tricked the younger brother into doing something stupid. Like, hey, let's go get grandfather naked. Again, I'm giving this a possibility. I'm not saying this is what happened. And so they kind of used him as their servant to do their dirty work. He, they used him to do the dirty work. So the curse, he says, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. So what Noah I believe Noah's doing is being passive aggressive. It sounds like he's only cursing Canaan, but he's cursing everybody else in a, in a passive aggressive, almost sarcastic sort of way. And here's why. If Canaan is going to be a servant of servants, that means that everybody who is his slave master or the word is actually slave. It could be translated slave or servant. So he'll be a slave of slaves or servant of servant. That means that whoever rules over Canaan is also a servant. It just makes sense to me. Once again. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. So if his brethren, if he's going to be a servant unto his brethren, it means his brothers are going to be servants or slaves too, right? Because he's the slave or servant of servants. So that would mean that all of Ham's, the rest of Ham's children got cursed. But not necessarily just Ham's children, because you're going to find that sometimes cousins and nephews are referred to as brothers in the Bible as well. So it may have been a bunch of the kids in on this prank and they tricked him into doing it. It may have just been Ham's children, but Ham's children get cursed if they're going to be um, the master over Canaan because he's going to be the servant of servants. Now, I believe in applying the text equally across the board. So if I'm going to say that about Ham's children and say, OK, well, Noah cursed Canaan to be the servant of servants. And if Canaan is their servant, that makes them servants. We have to apply this equally and we can't make excuses. So then Noah says, and he said, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Now, he didn't bless Shem. He said, blessed be the Lord God of Shem and Canaan shall be his servant. Passive aggressive. What is Canaan? The servant of servants. But Canaan's going to be servant to Shem, right? So wouldn't that mean Shem is going to be a servant? And we see 
that many of us have talked about the captivities, the multiple captivities that Israelites have been in. Israelites have been servants. Canaan shall be a servant of servants. So it seems that Shem may have been cursed in a passive aggressive sort of way. But then he comes down to verse 27. God shall enlarge Japheth and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem and Canaan shall be his servant. So wait, I thought Canaan was the servant of servants. So wouldn't that make Japheth also a servant at some point? And we haven't touched on the servitude of the Gentiles yet, which I will touch on. Now, I don't believe it's going to be as brutal and as harsh as some of these camps hope it'll be. However, there is a servitude of Japheth coming. So again, passive aggressive curse on Japheth. But we're going to dig more into the curse on Japheth in a second. Because there's more to this, not just the servant of servant part. He says, um, God shall enlarge Japheth and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem and Canaan shall be a servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. So, again, I could be reaching, but let's look at the rest of what was said to Japheth, because this is going to become important. I don't want to give that part away. It's going to become important. I'm, I'm going to tell you in a second. I am going to tell you. I'm not just going to keep it a secret, but I'm going to tell you. So, Japheth. Noah may have cursed Japheth with delusions of grandeur. God shall enlarge Japheth and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem and Canaan shall be his servant. So Canaan is a servant of servants. Japheth is going to be a servant based on reasoning. So now Japheth is going to be enlarged right here. 6601. Japheth. 6601. Japheth. Looks kind of like Japheth, right? Notice the, this is 3315. This is 6601. So this is in, translated as enlarge. Notice the, notice the letters here. We're going to get into those in a second. Just want to point this out. There's only a one letter difference between these. We'll come back to that. So enlarge looks very similar to Japheth. Just wanted to drive that home. So 6601. Pata. See it's spelled different over here. But anyway, pata. This is this is goes back to what I was saying about variations on the word and them uh, connecting to the root word and not necessarily the exact word that's being used. So you have to be paying attention to that. Now, it means to be spacious or wide. The only place it's translated as enlarge is in Genesis 927. Every other place. Now, I've touched on this before. Translated as seduce, entice. Deceive, deceive, deceive. So the Lord shall enlarge Japheth or deceive Japheth, entice Japheth. Now, if you understand this right here, again, 6601, the Lord shall deceive Japheth. You can then understand this. Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 19. O oh Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction, the Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity and things wherein there is no profit. Now, remember, I said Japheth. Is the link to the Gentiles, the Gentiles descend from Japheth, if I'm wrong, none of this stuff should be consistent. If the Gentiles d descend from Japheth and Noah woke up from his wine told Canaan he's going to be a servant of servants and then told Japheth Canaan's going to be your servant and he says the Lord is going to deceive you or allure you that doesn't sound like a blessing that sounds like a curse so that's what led me to think that wait Noah's not blessing Shem and Japheth he's cursing them he's cursing Canaan he's cursing the brothers he's cursing all their lineage to be slaves because they made him the butt of this joke and why would Shem and Japheth get cursed because Instead of going to their father and just being honest about it, they try to cover it up. Now, we see in part of the Bible, I, uh, I forgot to pull the reference, but I will have to pull the reference. Japheth is referred to as the elder. So if Japheth is the elder and Shem or Ham would be the younger. But we see this thing in the Bible where the elder shall serve the younger. So it makes sense that Canaan would be a servant of servants because eventually um, Japheth is going to go into servitude. 
So now we see that the Lord shall deceive Japheth. And Japheth is referred to the Gentiles. So when we see when we come across this verse about the Gentiles saying they inherited lies, it now makes sense. Oh, Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction. The Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, surely our father have our fathers have inherited lies, vanity and things where they're in wherein there is no profit. Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 19. So now let's continue. Now, I often get into some side quest, I'll call them. And I notice things and I used to have a certain way of thinking. And I have to say not anymore. And I'm going to show you exactly what I mean. So is this hidden in plain sight or am I just reaching? You guys can tell me what you think. Now, I noticed something in this verse. Oh, Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction. I notice this is interesting because it's talking about the day of affliction. And if you go back to the addressing the evidence series, I talk about the Gentiles coming from the end of the earth. It says the Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth. And I talk about the um, directions east and west. And I talk about how far east you can go before you hit the United States and how far west you can go before you hit the United States. Go watch Addressing the Evidence, the series. Now, something else stood out to me because people are under the impression that chapters and verses don't mean much because they were added later. And I'm under the impression that God is all knowing, like the verse that I read in the beginning. He said, declaring the end from the beginning, I will do all my pleasure. So I noticed something in this verse. The Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth. But it happens to be in a book of prophecy. Chapter 16, 19. And isn't that when we say the 400 year servitude started? So is it coincidence or was that put there by God? I don't know. The Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth. 16, 19. Again, I could be reaching. Could be a hundred percent complete coincidence. It could be coincidence that it mentions the day of affliction. The Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth. It's in a book about prophecy, chapter 16, 19, or God could have God could have put it in plain sight. I don't know. But I find these types of things interesting because this is not the only one I found. I found other chapters and verses that coincide with interesting dates that things have happened, which made me start looking at the Bible in a completely different way. I don't use it to try to interpret future events or anything like that. So don't think I'm getting off into any of that, but I do see things that line up with Bible prophecy and the verses correspond to the years in which many people believe they happened. And I'm not sure how many people have noticed this, but I've noticed it. So this is something to keep an eye out on when you see certain key verses of prophecy. Look at the um, chapter and verse and see if it corresponds. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. But the thing is, people will tell you, well, that shouldn't matter again because the chapters and verses were added later. But if God is all knowing and all powerful, and he's telling you the end from the beginning. He planned on that. He knew that would happen. It didn't catch him by surprise. So where these verses and chapters got placed may have been under his complete control this whole time. So, again, 1619 could be a coincidence, but the Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth. 1619. Just an interesting observation. So now the whole situation with Ham kind of reminds me of the scene from Fresh Prince. If you uh, are familiar with this scene, this is when he walked in and caught his uh, mom in bed with Lisa's dad and he uh, <laughs> he lost it. So, yeah, it's a pretty funny scene. But anyway. Was Ham actually cursed? Now, if we look again carefully at the text, Canaan gets cursed to be a servant of servants. And he says he's going to be a servant of his brothers. So now his servant, his brothers are cursed to be servants as well. He's going to be a servant of Shem. Shem's line is now cursed to be servants at some point. Japheth, he's going to be a servant of Japheth. So that means Japheth's line is going to become servants. But Ham, Ham, the individual, not the whole line, Ham is never cursed. Noah doesn't say anything about Ham. Ham's name isn't mentioned other than he saw what happened and he told his brothers from beginning to end. It was Shem and Japheth who decided to cover up Noah. And once again, the Lord shall or 
Yeah, the Lord shall enlarge Japheth or deceive Japheth or allure Japheth or entice Japheth. So how do we connect Japheth to this foolish nation that we talked about in part one, angered by a foolish nation? I talked about the foolish nation was the Gentiles. We know that because Paul said he was talking to the Gentiles in order to make those of his flesh Israel jealous. So we know that Paul in Corinth was not talking to the northern kingdom. He was talking to a different people, the Gentiles, the foolish nation that the Lord was going to use to anger his people, the lost sheep of Israel, back to him. This is all important. And this is why you can't throw out Paul. This is why some of these guys who don't understand Paul want to throw him out because they don't know the scriptures like Paul knew the scriptures. Paul grew up in it. Some of these dudes are just now picking it up and they want to tell you that they know more than Paul and Paul is contradictory. No, Paul knew the scripture better than they will ever know it. You don't throw out the teacher because the student decides that they're in first grade and they know calculus better than the college professor. It's, it's a ridiculous idea that you would throw out Paul. So Japheth, I pointed out before, Japheth, 33.15, different word than the other word I showed you. Right here, 33.15. Again, I want to make sure you see it, 33.15. Japheth, a son of Noah, son of Noah. It comes from the root word pata. Now, if you go down, further down the page, you will see pata. What was Pata 6601? So now again, I want to point out uh, if you go to BibleHub.com, when you come to 3315, you will see this right here, Pata. If you scroll down further, you will see the same word again. Now, if you click the one further down the page, not this one, don't click this one just yet. If you click the one further down the page, it will give you this 6601. We just read that. Uh, I'll go back and show you one more time. Right here, a large 6601. But now we're looking at 315. Oh, there you go, right there. Uh, 6601. We just read Pata, right? So we're familiar with that. So Yafit Pata. 6601. To be spacious, wide open. But if you click this one right here, the one I told you not to click just yet, if you click this one, it'll bring up 6601B. And it means to be simple. Allure. Became enticed, deceived, deceived, enticed, enticed, entices, persuade, prevails, seduces, silly or simple. So this is what Japheth's name means. Right here, it says um, denominative, denominative verb from pethy. So I decided to go dig into pethy. It says simple, perhaps open minded, possibly open minded. OK, interesting to be simple, to be simple. No one likes to be called simple. This is not a good thing. Japheth is called simple. And it's connected to a word that means deceived. Hopefully this is starting to make sense. This doesn't sound like Noah was blessing Japheth. He named him simple and deceived. But if you keep going down to the strong concordance, it means foolish. Simplicity seducible see hebrew pata is it a coincidence that the lord said he's going to use a foolish nation is it a coincidence that paul was preaching to the gentiles and paul understood that the descendants of japheth were the foolish nation that the most high said he was going to use to drive israel to jealousy is it a coincidence that in Genesis 10, Japheth's lineage are referred to as the Gentiles? Is it a coincidence that Noah tells Japheth he's going to be deceived like he tried to deceive Noah by covering him up like nothing happened? Is it a coincidence that Noah named him silly one or foolish one or seducible one? See, all this stuff is connected when you really start to dig for the truth. So. Who are the Gentiles? What have we learned about the Gentiles so far? We know that they're the descendants of Japheth. And I'm, I'm going to get into the northern kingdom stuff. So for those of you who still keep hitting me up, telling me Gentiles are the northern kingdom in the New Testament, I'm going to address it. Because so far we haven't seen anything that points to the fact that 
the Gentiles of the northern kingdom. And this is important because the, to me, in my opinion, the Bible isn't going to spend the entire Old Testament giving us detail after detail after detail telling us who the Gentiles are only to suddenly start calling Israelites Gentiles in the New Testament and causing confusion. It's the same confusion the camps want to cause because the camps, they can't understand Paul. They can't understand salvation for everybody. They can't understand this stuff. So they have to twist the Bible and lie and change it. Let's get rid of Paul. Well, let's get rid of Peter. Let's get rid of this section. Well, Jesus only came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Let's forget everything he said after that. Let's not talk about the marriage supper. The Bible says they can't marry Hittites. So we got to say the Hittites are really Israelites. The Bible says they can't marry Moabites. So we have to say the Moabites are really Israelites. The Sumerians, they're not really other people that got brought in there. They're really Israelites. The Gentiles, they're not really Gentiles. They're Israelites. There's a pattern when they can't interpret scripture, because as Peter said, they are unlearned. They can't interpret scripture. So what they do is they toss it out or they change it. Again, don't let these people teach you if they got to throw out scripture and bend scripture and twist scripture to fit their false interpretation of the Bible because they can't accept what the words are saying on the page. They don't care to do the digging or the history. They could have been presented a study like this on the Gentiles. They chose not to or the either they are not called to do so. So we know the, na the Gentiles are a nation of foolish people. And we went through that whole study, how they're not able to put together the pieces of the puzzles to come to a conclusion. We can show them all of this evidence and they still want more evidence, more evidence, more evidence. Hours and hours and hours, book after book after book. All throughout history, journals from their own people, and they still don't believe it. There are people without a culture. We studied that in Romans chapter 10, 19. They're a nation that is not dark. I pointed that out in Deuteronomy 32, 21. They are a nation that is not dark. So those of you out here saying Israel, Israel's black, Israel's Negro. And then you're trying to say that these people, the Gentiles, are really the northern kingdom. Now you have to say that, well, the northern kingdom wasn't dark. It, it just it, it causes a lot of problems to try to twist everything around and to just go with what the text says and follow it through no matter what the conclusion is. So now we're going to add this. Um, I should have add this, added this last time, but I didn't. But they're going to be the people used to provoke Israel to jealousy and anger. Understand that what you're seeing right now going on in some of the camps is a fulfillment of prophecy. Because many of these people were in the Christian church before and they thought they were the Gentiles and they fully believed in salvation when their salvation was on the line, when they thought they were Gentiles. But as soon as they became or as soon as they became aware of the knowledge that they are Israel, Suddenly they're like, no, he's our God. You can't have him. This is our salvation. You can't have him. So they're jealous and they're mad. Now, I understand why they're mad. Of course, we a lot of us are mad and we have a right to be mad because of the way we were treated. But the jealousy and the anger are all part of Bible prophecy. They don't want anybody else to have salvation because he came for us. This is our savior, not yours. We see it. It is the very definition of jealousy and is being fulfilled right in front of our eyes, not just the awakening. A lot of other factors are here and we often get caught up in um, the big signs so much that we miss the small stuff. Or as Christ said, you strain at a gnat and follow a camel. We all do it. And now from Genesis 9, 27, if I'm correct about the at Noah cursing them, we know that there are people that is that are going to go into servitude at some point, which again corresponds and corroborates the teaching that the gentiles will go into servitude because of what they've done and again i do not agree that it's going to be a harsh slavery like many of these camps ho hope it will be but i'm gonna come back to that later i'm not gonna get into the slavery of the gentiles so the next time <clears throat> in part four we're going to get into these um, descendants of Japheth. We're going to start placing them in their nations and we're going to start looking at even more clues in the Bible that tie this all together and furthermore prove that the Gentiles in the New Testament are not the northern kingdom. And we'll probably touch on Samaria at some point um, right after the Gentile study. So make sure you hit the thumbs up button if you have not hit it already. Make sure you click the subscribe button if you've not already subscribed. And make sure you click the notification bell if you have already subscribed. And if you have any questions about the Gentiles, please leave them in the comments. I will do my best to touch on them as we proceed through the series. Um, but with that said, until next time, I'm out.